From the Toronto Star, I'm Roger Mudler, and this matters. The kids are not all right. Generation Distress is the star's recently launched project that looks at the youth mental health crisis. Using a large team working across North America, this project aims to try to quantify the many issues that young people face in a calamitous and unsettling world that are leading to rising numbers of youth in crisis, reaching out for help, and often not finding it quickly enough. We need to warn the following discussion and related articles contain sensitive subject matters, including discussion of suicide and self-harm, that may be triggering for some people. If you are in trouble, please seek professional help. To tell us all about Generation Distress, we are joined by Robert Cribb. He's an investigative and foreign affairs reporter at the Toronto Star. He is also the director of the newly launched Investigative Journalism Bureau at the University of Toronto, which was a huge part of this project. Rob, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for doing this, I'm Griff. Okay, so you've just launched Generation Distress, a look at the youth mental health crisis. And while this is based on some really remarkable data, I think we should start at the bigger picture. This is a large project involving journalists all over North America. Tell us a little bit about what it entails, what type of overall information you're trying to get, and why. Yeah, so this is a behemoth. This is a monster project. It involved more than 70, 80 researchers, journalism students, journalists, academics, graduate students at universities across Canada and the U.S., actually. This is a cross-border investigation that took the better part of a year. And so we mobilized this army of mostly young journalism students and young journalists to tackle an issue that is about, you know, young people. So the, the reporters overwhelmingly working on this were the very demographic that we're writing about. And so there was real power in that. There was a real novelty in terms of the size and scope of it to do something ambitious on this massive subject. The numbers are growing dramatically around youth anxiety and depression. Universities are seeing huge increases in demand for counseling. So that got me thinking and did some smaller stories on this and then ultimately realized this is way, way bigger than anecdotal stories. This is a a massive health crisis in emergence. It is a heartbreaking topic. I've read at least the drafts of these pieces, and it's amazing how you have taken this from a very anecdotal thing and added a lot of numbers behind it. Let's start with this data, which is really remarkable. Where is it from? How did you get it? And what kind of picture does it paint? So we effectively set out to try and figure out how do we get all the data that we can possibly get from numerous different angles. So we don't want to rely on one source, one lens on this. We want to attack it from numerous perspectives. So the data comes from everywhere from we reviewed 100 academic published articles and pulled from it major themes and sort of the best knowledge that has been assembled around various subjects around this. We did a public opinion survey. So we commissioned a a company that's tied to the University of Toronto that went out and and got responses from 6,000 post-secondary students in Canada and the United States, which provided an incredible lens on this issue. And we also did very laborious data gathering. So we surveyed over 100 Canadian universities and colleges and asked them for mental health metrics. So things like their budgets for mental health counseling over the past five years, number of mental health accommodations over the past five years, number of mental health appointments over the past five years. In the end, 40 of them provided meaningful data to us. And the other really cool thing that we did, and again, this is the product of having the kind of resources, the collaborative power of all of these people, is we, through this network of young journalists and students, we interviewed 152 post-secondary students, Canada and the U.S., detailed, structured interviews, so the same 40 questions. So these are interviews that took about 30, 35 minutes And it allowed us to gather really powerful narratives and stories as well as data. You know, let's start talking about some of the stories. And I think the one that we should start with is Kyle Gardner. I guess, who was he? And can you tell us about him and why you wanted to tell his story? So in the course of doing this over the past year, you know, inevitably suicide emerges as a key theme. Suicide is the number two source in Canada and the U.S. of deaths of young people, believe it or not. And it's growing tragically. And so in the course of doing this reporting, inevitably you come across a number of cases of suicide. And we talk to friends and family and 
in several of these cases. And then we heard about Kyle, and I spent, myself and Morgan Bachnack from The Star, we went and spent a whole afternoon, we did something like a four or five hour interview with his parents in Aurora. There's uh, some things that come easy as a parent. You don't get to do just the easy things. The job description is you have to do all the things, even the hard things. And one of the hard things is, you know, getting your kids to recognize mental health problems and being able to take the correct steps when they're struggling. And, uh, you know, it was clear that Kyle didn't do that. He knew the right steps to take. He had the resources. He told other people the right steps to take, but he couldn't take them himself. You know, we both walked out of the house completely and utterly devastated, but also incredibly moved by his story and the potential for that story to bring readers in to the much larger societal changes that are happening here. He, in so many ways, reflects what all the numbers are telling us. He is such a powerful voice. And in, in some ways, you know, it's so strange. I was just talking to the editors that are working on this. Story. There's, there's a whole group of us at the Star that have been poring over this over the last few weeks. And to a person, everybody who has delved into his story has been touched. And so <laughs> really, like we're all sort of breathless when we read his words and his social media posts and his journal and see his image. He sort of touched this group of us at the Toronto Star in a really real way. And I sort of feel like I really got to know him through his parents and through his own writing. So he's the exemplary young Canadian guy, like just lovely, heartfelt, cared deeply about the planet, about indigenous rights. It seemed like the world was at his feet. I mean, he had everything, man. He was raised by great parents in a beautiful home in the suburbs. He traveled in the summers and, and did canoe and camping trips in the far north. Ultimately, he went to university in the Netherlands, got on a plane, went off on his own and, and went to school in the Netherlands. He was doing everything right, got great grades, 95th percentile in his LSATs, wanted to become a lawyer, and went off to China ultimately to teach. And that's where he lived for a while. And he came back last year and he was at home and he was hopeful and he was preparing job applications and applications to law school. You know, he's doing what any 22 year old would be doing and he's charting his future. And then tragically one morning his parents wake up and he's not there. It was utterly incomprehensible to them and to virtually everybody who knew him and remains an enigma that no one can really understand. And so much of his story reflects both the tragedy and scope of this issue, but also, you know, how ultimately the numbers really only take us so far. His story sort of picks up where the numbers leave off and provide a heartbeat that is just so utterly riveting and terrifying and deeply, deeply sad. We'll be right back. Kyle's story obviously affected me too, and I have to say, one of the things is, he's the lens to a lot of other people, but one of the differences about Kyle is, is that he didn't really reach out for help as far as we know, and the thing is, is that you've talked to a number of other people, and the scary thing is these numbers are growing, but a lot of the young people are saying that they can't find help, or that's, and the big complaint from students is not getting help quickly enough. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, it's a chronic issue that comes up again and again. In some cases, it's just flat out wait times, right? We've heard about the wait times issues before, but boy, when you really dig into it and you hear the impact and the repercussions from young people who are in crisis and do call for help, they go, they show up at the mental health counseling department on campus or they reach out to a counselor or whatever. And they're told, yeah, let us get back to you in a few weeks, or here's an appointment in two months or three months or five months. It is utterly deflating and devastating. And 
And the repercussions of that, I mean, are untold. How could we possibly know? But certainly from the accounts that we've gathered, it is a profound resource problem a profound resource problem and the stakes could not be higher. You know, there's lots of resource problems in lots of areas of our systems. But when you think about the potential impacts of this one, it is difficult to contemplate in those moments. And then I think that there's another category that falls under this umbrella, which is people that young people who simply don't call for help for a whole bunch of really complicated reasons. Stigma is certainly one of them. I think stigma has gotten better, for sure. There's been a number of campaigns. Bell Let's Talk is the most prominent of them, I think, that has reduced stigma. But it still remains. And there's also some cultural specificity to that. There's particular communities for which stigma continues. There's lack of diversity in terms of counseling and language offerings at most universities and even in, in the public health care system around this. There's just a lot of people who seem to be unable to come forward and seek out that help. So it's sort of a combination of insufficient resources, which are forcing people to wait far too long to a point where it's almost too late. And people who simply feel that there is no help for them, that the kinds of help that they need don't even exist. It's not even a matter of waiting for it. It just doesn't exist for them. So Those two things combined, I think, are truly tragic. In Kyle's case, we actually don't know whether he reached out for help at his university. Nobody would know that except, you know, the counselors at that school, and they can't talk about that. But it's certainly clear from the data and from the work that we did that it is a chronic problem. There's no doubt about that. We've been talking a lot about university students. I know you also took a look at younger children in sort of the kindergarten to grade 12. This is also a problem that is getting worse for them, too, correct? Yeah, for sure. It's across the board. The big thing with the K-12 to is, you know, so much of the research around this would suggest that if there is a single bullet, right, like there never is a one bullet point, but if there is a single thing that we could do from a solutions lens on this, it would be to detect early and treat early mental health issues as they appear in K-12. to All of the math on this would suggest if you did that one thing, if you could identify early treat early. This spike that we see in university and college around the sort of the 18 and 19 to 20 year old would take care of itself in the sense that why is there such a spike at that age? Well, so this is the age where so many young people find their first hint of independence. They may be living outside of home. They are facing real academic pressures. Maybe they're working at the same time. And so all of these latent mental health issues or perhaps not latent mental health issues that were not properly addressed and treated early on are suddenly triggered in a way that's never happened before. And so what the spikes that we're seeing at the university and college level, many experts would say that it's not really about that. It's about what we didn't do 10 years earlier. It's very clear that at least one of the key takeaways from this is greater investment earlier in this issue so that we're able to address it, nip it in the bud at a mass level before we see the kinds of overwhelming and impossible to address spikes that no university president or no provincial government could possibly deal with. By that point, it's just a tsunami. It's just too late. Well, this is just a, this is a staggering problem. I'm really glad you started talking about solutions because I know that you cover some of them. What can we start to do? What are some of the things that seem to be at least helping in certain jurisdictions? Yeah, we looked at a number of kind of innovations around this issue. One of the key ones is looking at how the system works now, which is it's pretty broken up. It's filled with terrific people doing terrific work. There's no question about that. The people who tend to work in this field, the ones that we've talked to are all so dedicated. But, you know, the system's are largely based on these sort of fiefdoms. So they're very much broken up. One of the interesting models that we've looked at is called the hub model. So this allows a whole bunch of different types of professionals to come together essentially under one roof. So it's a one-stop shop approach. So you have the social worker, you have the psychiatrist, you have the person who can help you with housing, you have the person who can help you figure out access to jobs. So what were once five different people in five different locations spread across the city or the region 
suddenly you all come together under one roof. They're able to holistically look at you and say, okay, so what are your needs? Okay, so you want to move out of house because it's a mental health stress for you, so we need to find you housing. Okay, so you talk to Joe for that. And then you cross the hallway and you talk to Mary for counseling. And then you go down the hallway a little bit further and you talk to Phil, who's going to you know, help you with finances. And that has proven to be, from all the early evidence, and it's pretty fresh in this country, it's, it's really only a few years old, that's proven to be a really interesting model. And it's popping up, but again, you know, there's lots of resource and funding issues with that, and the sustainability isn't yet proven. But man, it, it just at just a basic common sense level, it just resonates so deeply. And the young people that we spent time with who've gone through that kind of model rave about it. And these are young people that sort of went through the traditional approach to this and suddenly found this model and would tell you that it's dramatically improve the care that they've received. So that's one that we really want to highlight. We've spent a lot of time on it. It's certainly a hopeful step forward for sure. Well, Rob, this is incredibly important work. I think our audience is going to appreciate it and what it can tell us about this problem, which I mean, as a parent, scares the heck out of me. But I think this is a great start. There's much more more to read. I want to thank you for your time. But is there anything that I didn't ask that you think that our listeners really should know before I let you go? I mean, I guess the only thing I'd say is if your listeners are parents like I am and like you are, I think one of the real takeaways sort of for me is the vital importance of talking about this stuff. I've certainly become far more vocal with my daughter about this stuff and check in more and approach the awkward conversations with greater confidence because I've just spent the last year seeing what the potential implications are of not doing that. I was speaking the other day with the parents of Kyle Gardner. You know, maybe you've just got to deal with these things. He'll overcome them because all the paths, it doesn't matter which path he chooses, they're all good. I just had no concept that suicide was something that was even considered a path for him. And I sort of asked him that kind of question. What do you want parents to know? through your lens, and Terry's his name, and he's an incredibly articulate guy and has been devastated, of course, and destroyed by this. He just said, talk to your kids, don't wait. You know, I had it in my mind, I wanted to talk to my son about this because I was seeing some things and I wasn't sure, and I, I had it in my mind that I'm gonna wait for the right time and I'm gonna bring it up. And then I woke one day and it was too late. It was already too late. So. If there's a moral to this story as a parent, it's don't wait. On that note, Rob, I really, really want to thank you for your time and for this important story. Thanks for doing this. I'm grateful. Robert Cribb is an investigative and foreign affairs reporter at the Toronto Star. He is the director of the Investigative Journalism Bureau at the University of Toronto. That's it for today. Thanks so much for joining us. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Rajin Mudder, Adrian Chung, and Saba Etisaz. Produced and mixed by Sean Patton, and our director of programming is J.P. Foso. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon. 